In order to proceed to Bayes' theorem, let's consider the region that is the intersection of Heat movies and Tom Hanks movies, which is this part of the of the diagram. Okay, so we are looking at all of Tom Hanks' Heat movies. Now, what I'm saying is that the area of this region can be expressed in two different ways. One way is to look at it as a proportion of all Tom Hanks movies. In other words, we can say that this area is nothing but the probability of hit given Hanks, which is 60%, right? Given, we, we, if we know that this is Tom Hanks, then we know that 60% of the movies are hits, right? So if you've got a movie and you know that it's a Tom Hanks movie, then you know that there's a 60% chance that it's a hit. Okay, so that is probability of hit given Hanks, which is 60%. But of course, 60% is not the area of this region. It doesn't occupy 60% of the total area. That is because this forms 60% of something which is only 10%. Because Tom Hanks movies are only 10% of all movies. And this happens to be 60% of that 10%. And therefore, of course, we know that the region, area of this, this region is 6%, right? In other words, we can express the area of this region as probability of hit given Hanks multiplied by the probability of the, of the movie itself being a Hanks movie, okay? So that's one way to, to express this area. And of course, area is probability since we've considered the total area to be one. So any areas we talk about are all probabilities. Okay, so we can consider this represented in that way. Um, and the second way in which we can represent it is to see it as a fraction of hit movies. In other words, we can say area of this region is nothing but probability of Hanks given that it's a hit movie, right? So that is given that it's a hit movie, which is what this left hand side region is, what is the probability that it's a Hanks movie? So once again, we already calculated that as one fifth or uh, 20%, right? Which is nothing but six divided by 30, that's 20%, one fifth, right? But what we're saying is this is 20% of the hit movie region. It's not 20% of the entire region, but the hit movie itself, hit movies themselves comprise 30% of the total region and therefore, this region is nothing but 20% multiplied by 30%, which is just 6% of the total region. Okay, of course, both ways we get six. So what we are looking at here is two different ways in which we can express the same area of the same region. And therefore, these two are actually equal. So these two expressions are equal and effectively Bayes' theorem is derived from that. So in the previous slide, we looked at two different ways of calculating the area of the region that indicates the intersection of Tom Hanks movies and hit movies. That is the part of the diagram that is common to both of them. And what we found out was that those two areas, of course, are equal because they're just two different ways of calculating the same area. And therefore, the left hand side and the right hand side of the expression above are actually equal. That is probability of hit given Hanks multiplied by probability of Hanks is the same as probability of Hanks given hit multiplied by the probability of a hit, which is really the probability of Hanks and hit. So of course we can easily rearrange the terms and write it like this. All we've done is we've taken probability of Hanks on the left hand side, put it in the denominator on the right hand side or alternately we divide both sides of the equation by probability of Hanks and we get this equation and in fact that is Bayes' theorem. So in a matter of two slides we just derived Bayes' theorem at least from an intuitive perspective. Uh, I don't suspect that you will get a simpler explanation of this theorem than what you just got. So we've got Bayes' theorem. Now of course we still have to worry about what is the relevance of Bayes' theorem to everything that we are talking about? Well, before we do that, let's take a look at an example, another example of Bayes' theorem, going back to 
the problem that we've been looking at earlier. So now let's say we want to calculate, given that a person is a Mexican, what is the probability of the person being a buyer? Right? We already know that that's 5 by 9. Okay, So that we get by inspection, we can get 5 by 9 just by looking at the number of dots in that region. But then we can also apply Bayes' theorem to calculate that. So we can say that it's equal to probability of Mexico given buyer multiplied by probability of buyer divided by probability of Mexico, which is just the application of Bayes' theorem. So we can plug in all the numbers and get the same answer, 5 by 9. Okay, so that's really what Bayes' theorem is all about. But let's see what is the relevance of Bayes' theorem to what we are talking about. Okay, so what we are talking about in our example, what we have is data about lots of flights, 2,200 flights really. Some of them are delayed, some of them are non-delayed. But let's assume that a part of these flights represent our region of interest, which is X. Of course, X happens to be the consideration that we had put, which is Monday, 3 p.m., uh, United Airlines, DCA to LaGuardia, good weather. That's really X. Okay, So that's all of that is what X represents. And what we're really talking about is, given all those conditions, what is the probability of a delay? That's really what we are interested in, okay? But of course, we know that that region is really small in our data, but here I've just drawn it so that we can draw, write it out in terms of Bayes' theorem and then look at how we're going to approximate it. So we write it in terms of Bayes' theorem and we can say probability of delay given X is nothing but probability of X given delay multiplied by de probability of delay divided by probability of X, which is just Bayes' theorem as we derived it couple of minutes back. Okay, so let's see what we can do from this. So we can say probability of delay given x is this, we've just written it out. But this is where we're going to now do a small slate of hand. Okay, what we're going to do is to say that the numerator, probability of x given delay, multiplied by probability of delay, we're going to calculate it differently because unfortunately, we don't have enough number of cases to calculate that probability of x given delay because the whole set of things in x which is you know monday 3 pm etc 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 that doesn't occur frequently in our data set so how are we going to calculate probability of x given delay we cannot do that similarly the denominator probability of x we don't know what it is because there are too few cases for us to be able to determine it in fact it is possible that x doesn't even occur in our entire data set so this expression by itself is not evaluatable but like those people on streets hustlers who do the three card trick and fool us every time we are going to do the same thing here so we are going to say probability of delay given x is probability of x given delay multiplied by probability of delay even though there is no data for x in the data set what we are now going to do is to say we're going to approximate that expression by the expression that is given below. In other words, we are going to assume, clearly it's an approximation, we have no choice because we don't have enough data, so we have to approximate. So we have to assume that probability of United Airlines given delay is independent of probability of Monday given delay. And that is independent of probability of DCA given delay, etc. So we're just going to assume that all of those independent conditional probabilities are all independent of each other. Whereas in reality, there may not be. For example, uh, th there may be more flights which are delayed from DCA, which start at 3 p.m., right? So the two things may be bound together. They may not be independent. But for the purpose of approximation, we're going to simply assume that they are independent. That is where the naive part of naive base comes from. It's clearly not accurate, but it's an approximation seems to work in quite a few cases, okay? So we're going to approximate it by saying the top expression is nothing but probability of UA given delay multiplied by probability of 3 p.m. given delay, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to break out that whole expression, X given delay into its components, each of its components given delay, and we're going to multiply all of those probabilities. That is the naive part that comes. Similarly, we're also going to calculate probability of on time given X. Remember, what we said is we'll calculate both these probabilities 
and we'll classify a particular case as the one which has the higher probability. So for example, for our case, suppose we find that probability of delay is 0 0.6 and probability of it being on time therefore is 0.4. So then we'll say, well, our guess is it's going to be delayed because that has the higher probability, right? So that's what we want to do. Of course, I'm still not minimizing the fact that there's no way we can calculate this probability. Okay, fine. We approximated the numerator. Uh, we are able to approximate it because if you take each of these individual cases, like probability of UA given delay, probability of 3 p.m. given delay, there are going to be lots of records for each of these, right? So this expression we can calculate. But what about probability of X in the denominator? We are still stymied with that, right? But we're going to come to that shortly, another slate of hand shortly, okay? So probability of on time also is going to look like this, probability of X given on time uh, prob multiplied by probability of on time divided by probability of X, right? Once again, we can calculate probability of X. We can approximate probability of X given on time just like before by breaking it up into its component parts, approximate it like this, right? But the point is, Okay, so we can calculate the numerator for both of these probabilities. So what? Looks like we're still not done. But if you look at both of these expressions, right, probability of delay given x and probability of uh, on time given x, they differ only in the numerator. We don't care about the denominator, right? They differ only in the numerator because no matter what the denominator is, it's the same for both of them. We can calculate it. It is something but it's the same for both of them. And therefore, the relative magnitudes of these two expressions is only controlled by the numerator. Whichever one has the higher numerator has the higher probability. So we don't have to worry about calculating the denominator. This is where the three card trick comes in. We forget the denominator, we just calculate the numerator and we'll classify it as whichever has the higher numerator, right? So if we calculate the first expression, the expression for delay, and it gets some value in the numerator. We calculate the expression for on time, that gets something in the numerator, and we see which of them is greater. Whichever is greater, we classify a case according to that. So that is really where the trick is, that we first approximate the calculation, and then also notice that we can ignore the denominator altogether. So that is really how it's going to work, right? So we ignore the denominator, choose the case, which corresponds to the uh, to the greater numerator. Okay, so calculate the numerator assigned to the higher value class. You're done. That's all naive based us. If you really think about it, it's a fairly smart approach to doing things. Not very naive after all. Okay, so what are the characteristics of naive base? The good thing is it uses all the data, not just matches, unlike exact base, right? Because exact base fails when there's, there's no complete match. However, there is still information buried in all of these partial matches and naive base is able to utilize those. Of course, it makes the assumption of independence of the conditional probabilities of the predictor variables. We saw that. And uh, in practice, the estimate that it gives doesn't differ too much from what exact base calculates. And of course, the calculations are not too many. The fairly simple calculations and they're practical under most circumstances. So it's a good attractive alternative to uh, other classification techniques. Okay, so the summary is here. It's good for purely categorical data. It can handle very large data set. Of course, computations are very simple as we've already seen and as you will also see in the hands-on lab. It does require a large number of records, right? We saw the curse of dimensionality and even with the curse of dimensionality, even with 2,200 records, we found that that was still very few compared to the total number of possibilities. It would have been nice if we had something like 5,000 or 10,000 records, which is still less than the total number of combinations, but actually speaking, it would have performed much, much better. In fact, in the hands-on activity, you will actually try out this approach, right? But sometimes what happens is that the predictor category, even the conditional thing, when we said probability of UA given delay, probability of 3 p.m. given delay, we broke down the expression in the approximation. Sometimes there are no cases available even for those sub-expressions. In those cases, naive base has a problem. There are some corrections that are applied. In fact, 
or by def default applies those corrections. So it does do something, but you know, as you keep having all of these problems, the quality of the algorithm keeps on deteriorating. Okay, uh, in a, from a practical point of view, you can make exact probability calculations, but more likely what is going to be useful is the rankings, right? So that is, let's say we are given 100 cases and we need to rank them. These 100 cases may be, for example, in a mail order scenario, you're talking about who are the 100 people to whom I should send out. I've got 10,000 people who are the top 100 to whom I should send out, right? So we may calculate exact probabilities and just order them. After that, it's only the, the ordering that's important to us. And ranks come out very good in naive base. So the probabilities may still be wrong, but the rankings come out much more accurately. Okay, so based on practical considerations, it does give good lift in many applications. And it's useful for applications that require a probability lift. In fact, as I had mentioned at the very start of this lecture, in reality, to be effective, algorithms don't have to give dramatic improvements in performance. Okay, so for example, if uh, the naive approach would have led us to say everything uh, everybody is a non-buyer, right? That might make a mistake of only 2% because the population contains only 2% of buyers. But if out of those 2%, you're even able to salvage half a percent, which is one fourth of those. So literally speaking, the algorithm, uh, act, uh, the improvement was from 98% to 98.5%. Looks like a very small improvement, but in terms of monetary impact, in terms of effectiveness, it could be a very large effectiveness. Okay, so in those senses, even a small amount of lift can actually be hugely beneficial. So naive base doesn't have an implementation in Rattle. In other words, what I'm saying is Rattle doesn't cover this data mining algorithm. And therefore, we're going to have to do everything by hand in R. Okay, so this exercise, the hands-on exercise, is going to be a little bit different from all the other exercises you've done so far because you were able to use R Commander and you were able to use Rattle to get everything done. But here, there are a lot of detailed steps for which you have to type out lots of commands. But the good news is I've prepared an extensive lab document, in fact, two documents, which you can work through. And you really must work through those documents if you are to be able to do anything with the assignments. You have to work through those documents, but they are detailed documents and uh, should keep you in very good uh, stand. So please work on those. And in fact, you must really work on those because at the end of those uh, interspersed within the lab handouts, I've got a number of questions that you're supposed to go and answer on swap. Okay, so I want to make sure that you're understanding the concepts as you go along so I'm, I've given lots of problems for you to solve and you definitely need to answer those questions. Okay, I think the most important part of this course is what you do hands-on, because you may talk a lot, I may talk a lot, but ultimately, when the rubber hits the road, if you're not able to perform the calculations, then the whole course is a waste. Okay, so you have to take the hands-on exercises extremely seriously. And the other thing about hands-on exercises is, it's possible to blindly follow along the instructions and get the work done but that's completely useless. Unless you understand what is going on, you're not going to gain from it. And that is why I have put in questions right through. And it's really important for you to stop, answer the question, then proceed to get the maximum benefit out of the labs. That's it for the week in terms of lectures. I'll be shortly posting everything on Blackboard. And uh, I want you to take a look at the roadmap for the week and then follow all the steps in the sequence in which I have outlined.